This is a rebroadcast of a presentation I gave at Drupal Camp Wisconsin 2014. Uh, this was a keynote speech that day, and while it wasn't recorded, I wanted to put the message out there because it's a very different talk than I normally give uh, on topics of Drupal, and I, I thought it was a, a decent one. So, welcome to Drupal Camp Wisconsin. Uh, oops. Uh, so, who am I? Uh, Hi, my name is Brian Olenike. Uh, we're at BTO Pro. I work in the College of Arts and Architecture at uh, Penn State in the eLearning Institute. Uh, we use Drupal for online courseware development and application development. Uh, I've been doing Drupal for way too long at this point, like seven years, and I kind of view my actual job as to automate itself out of existence. So, who are we? Where have we been? Um, so. ELI was founded in 07, I'm one of the original employees there. Um, we've had some projects that were reasonably successful along the way, things like uh, the Outline Designer, which lets you structure content appropriately, the Open Studio, which allows students to uh, kind of have a conversation around images and media uh, to replicate what happens in a classroom, ELI Media, which is an asset management solution, um, and then we kind of peaked with our Drupal 6 usage in uh, 2012. Uh, and now we're kind of, say, breaking out the top of the spectrum um, with uh, the project I'm working on now called Elms Learning Network, uh, which is where we are today here in 2014. So this is not a talk about Elms Learning Network, but just extremely briefly. Um, it's effectively, you've got a lot of tools that I diagram about on a whiteboard and say, hey, they're all connected and this is awesome. And if anyone can follow my presentations, um, more power to you, because this is basically what my friends think. It's like, I, there's just like demons in the water or something. I have no idea what you're talking about, dude. But basically, uh, we're augmenting the LMS with an entire ecosystem of Drupal-based applications. Uh, they all talk to each other via web services, and so the hope is that we can build uh, a more robust ecosystem around an LMS to eventually replace the LMS. So what is the Elms Learning Network development team look like? Bingo. Uh, everyone that has ever contributed to Drupal in any way, uh, or any of the contrib modules, is effectively an Elms Learning Network developer. Um, now we do have a, an actual development team. Um, there's there's two full-time people towards the project. Uh, there'll be students in the near future. Uh, and the really exciting part that I'm here to announce today is a partnership that's been formed between uh, College of Arts and Architecture eLearning Institute and uh, Wisconsin Center for Patient Partnerships in the, uh, the law school. So a, a grant was awarded to the law school at Wisconsin uh, to pilot Elms Learning Network. Uh, the target date for that is 2015 and um, so the system's been in use at Penn State. Uh, the system's been in use actually here at Wisconsin for you know five courses over the last year. Um, things have gone really well. They were awarded an innovation grant for this, uh, kind of seed money to get this project going even further, see if it can roll out for the whole law school. Uh, so that's what I'm here talking about today. Uh, very briefly, what the system looks like. So we've got, uh, you know, it's Drupal-based course interface, if you will. So we hook on our content to an outline. Uh, and you see, we can make it look very different uh, because it's Drupal. So this is actually running the same base distribution uh, in Drupal, uh, which is kind of a pre-configured version of Drupal uh, called the MOOC platform. And each one of these is starting at that point, but then as you can see, it looks very different uh, with very different functionality sets. CPP honestly uses MOOC more as a, an LMS, um, just because there's forums and uh, some additional functionalities in there that with arts and architecture doesn't use. Um, Looking ahead, this is kind of going more towards our next generation uh, usability because one of the full-time people on the project is a usability expert. Uh, so we can make this look drastically differently uh, to better meet the needs of each of our colleges or, or disciplines, um, but still use the same base platform to get there and allow us to you know, build on top of it. So I'm here to say the project was a success with the thumbs up and it's over okay okay stop uh, okay so it we actually have a year like a full year to go about 
doing this and, and we just started this relationship. So uh, instead, what I'm here to really talk about today is not so much Elm's Learning Network as what does Elm's Learning Network represent? Um, and to me, Elm's Learning Network in the context of a larger you know, societal ecosystem of tool sets and development is about this. It's, it's activism. Um, and that's not normally the way that the project is thought of. Uh, so I don't mean this kind of activism directly. I, I mean like digital activism, like improving the transparency of data to the public or fostering international aid initiatives, um, creating a more accessible internet that costs less money uh, because education is really expensive, um, and also lowering costs and reducing waste in government. This is a form of activism by a lot of different people in you know different communities, open source communities. Uh, so why do I refer to you know? Because it could just say, oh, these people doing their jobs, technology enhances. Uh, why do I feel that the Drupal community itself it really pushes this idea of digital activism, and why is this important? Because code is no longer just code, right? So it's systems of control and ways in which you you know, have people behave in society because everybody's got a cell phone that they're holding up and using every day, right? They, they're always engaged with technology, whether it's media through TV, the web. Uh, you are in a system of control and behavioral pattern, whether or not you realize it, and it's been created by other technologists. Uh, so you can use these different control things in, in ways that change the world, right? So Facebook and Twitter we're really able to bring about government collapse in, in, um, in the Middle East not terribly long ago. Um, you can also, you know, use those same platforms to manipulate the emotions of hundreds of thousands of users at scale. Yeah, um, that happened recently. Yay! You can also use these platforms to help increase uh, transparency of government, get people more engaged, and more vocal. Um, this is actually a really cool project that um, the US government has, which is built on Drupal. It's for creating petitions and, and trying to get people more engaged with government, but you can you know, also use these control systems that track literally everything that everyone does ever. Um, so it's, it's becoming about more than just writing code. Right? You can write code that does really horrific and wonderful things. So with great power comes great responsibility. And I really feel that, especially in uh, higher education and the public sector in general, we're kind of at a crossroads as a society uh, when it comes to you know, technology and life in general. Because as you can see, everybody's super happy with the direction that things are going in. I mean, you know, across the board, everyone's really pumped and like, Everything's getting less expensive. I mean, all those important things like college tuition and, and healthcare and food. I mean, everything's going down in price and people definitely are not taking on lots and lots more debt over the last 20 years now, which would indicate a trend of college costs going up and debt increasing. And then people, I mean, but they make more when they come out of school. Cool. Um, uh, I mean, but but like you're guaranteed a job, right? Like that's the really good thing about going to college is, is you're guaranteed a high skill labor job. I mean, if by guarantee you mean you have around a 60% chance of getting one of those type of jobs out of school. Um, but don't worry, it, the important thing is that, you know, public sector and, and institutions are actually investing more money. Oh, wait, no, they're not investing more money in, in education predominantly. Um, you can see certain groups are 40 to 50 percent cuts in education over the last decade. Uh, so we're no longer in a scenario where, you know, you're being asked to do more with less temporarily. This is what normal is now is constantly doing more with less resources. Um, and I, this is not a political type of a viewpoint that spans lots of administrations and things, but 
the reason I feel that we're in these throes, right, of not being able to really control costs or figure out what to do is because we're in the throes of um, a technological singularity. And so the singularity states that um, it's this idea that eventually machines and humans will kind of mesh with each other and then machines will actually be able to learn more rapidly than humans can. Uh, you're starting to see very early pinpricks of this as far as artificial intelligence goes um, with the internet, things like Google Now, uh, robots, you know, AR drones that self-pilot, things like that. So just, you can't really stop this. Be aware that it's, it, it's coming. Um, but how can we, you know, better position things as a society and as institutions? Because our, our institutions are built like this, generally speaking. We're very top-down uh, oriented. And as we can see, costs are going through the roof and byproduct is staying about the same in education. So we want to, what can we do to make sure that this doesn't happen, right? We don't want these institutions to just collapse on themselves. You know, people are really unhappy with them. They're really costly. Um, and so I view that we need to move more towards the, the kind of methodology and alignment that something like uh, Bitcoin is putting forth. Uh, where you have lots of smaller hubs and smaller authorities and everything is stitched together uh, the way that, you know, traditionally only technology can uh, to create this new type of organization, uh, an incredibly flat structure that's very, you know, apt to change, very responsive, um, lots of peer-to-peer -peer connections, and that forms your, your new units and your institution, in fact. It's, it's less about who reports to who directly um, and it's more about what groups of people report to each other. Uh, so why do I think, you know, Drupal can help this? How can Drupal help the public sector, help you know, governments, institutions uh, align and, you know, be able to get through this cost issue, <laughs> among other things that we're having? Uh, well, it's through Drupal, right? And it's, it's because Drupal allows you to do all of these you know, peer to peer types of relationships, individ pockets of innovation and individuals spreading out additional innovation to others and doing a lot more with a lot less uh, thanks to a dedication to automation. Uh, but you know, why Drupal? Because I mean like, you know, like, do I mean this Drupal, like this is the Drupal I'm talking about, right? The one where this is the, the image that comes up about the learning curve, you know, like just like, hey, you know, don't panic, stuff's broken, and you know, you don't know what's going on, and you just up late at night and you just like wanna strangle everything out of it, right? Right? I mean, you don't know why like markup is on the page, you don't know where that markup came from, and like what are the templates? I don't even know. I mean, sometimes it's upper uppercase, lowercase, it's dashes, underscores, you know, what is going on? Is this the Drupal I'm referring to? Oh yeah, this Drupal is the one I'm referring to, right? No, it's this one. This is the founder of Drupal several years ago. Um, I think there's great value in perfecting technologies that set out to eliminate the webmaster, the developer, and the designer. Right? And that was said by Dries, the, the founder of the Drupal project. And so this is a pretty lofty notion, you know, statement to see this seven years ago now. It's about when I got involved with the project is uh, that we are seeking to eliminate ourselves and, and by doing so you're able to you're forcing yourself to have to continue to learn to do more and you know just do more with less you're not even doing it with less you're doing it the same so that you keep building upon knowledge and destroying you know the industry in effect you keep collapsing the industry on itself uh, because of the skill sets that people need to move forward um, you know, other, other reasons is, um, this is a multi-million dollar system by any estimation, um, just in terms of the number of hours it would take to produce this on your own. Uh, and you get this all for free. Now, granted, you know, it's open source, so you, you get it free, free like a puppy. You have to take care of it, right? Um, but it's still free. Uh, there's also, as I mentioned, a huge dedication to automation and abstraction, and you can see this in certain projects within the Drupal ecosystem. So you've got things like rule uh, views, which is getting rid of database querying 
Um, it's amazing how many database queries that people make in Drupal, and they don't even think about or know anything about database querying, but they're basically structuring it via views. Uh, rules for automating workflows. You've got features for helping automate deployment. We can argue as to how well that's accomplished, but it's it does a decent enough job. Um, simple test, which is automated code testing and quality reviews, right? So there's basically a robot that sits there on Drupal.org and audits you know, code based on what we've told the robot to do. Uh, Coder, which helps with automatically upgrading code. So it's code rewriting code, right? We're really getting into machine learning and teaching machines to author additional things. And Drush, which Drush is so wonderful. The Drush is a, a command line Drupal, you know, really automating everything. I've got some projects as well in this this uh, part of the Drupal sphere where I just you feel like you're automating everything that you used to do once you learn it. And you're kind of like, why did I waste all this time? Um, and one last thing that I find in the Drupal community that I think is a, a good reason why we need to align with, with it for you know, helping reorganize institutions is that there's a big Drupal for good movement within um, the you know, the public sector and just Drupal in general, there's this general feeling that people are doing these things for the betterment of society. They're not just doing it for the paycheck or the mortgage kind of a thing. Uh, so let's look at some real quick public sector examples. Um, Georgia.gov had a goal of creating, you know, more accessible, uh, lowering costs and things. Um, it's estimated that this is the Georgia.gov migration off of a proprietary solution is going to start to save approximately a million dollars a year um, because they switched from bloated vendor contracts into more of the uh, you know, serve and support model uh, that they're on now. Uh, DCAN is a, another, it's a Drupal distribution uh, for improving transparency of public data, uh, which you can argue you know, leads to reduction in costs, increases participation, things like that. Um, Web Experience Toolkit is a project out of Canada um, that seeks to create a more accessible version of Drupal out of the box in terms of uh, you know, media that's produced. Um, this obviously then leads to you know, increased participation, increased access, as well as lowering costs because you're sharing resources and things. Uh, the open aid distribution um, is for organizations to uh, you know, foster international aid efforts, build microsites to talk about what their organization's doing and things uh, in a very cost-effective manner. And, you know, obviously, I was learning network, as I mentioned before, which is you know, seeking to help create um, unions between institutions, lowering, which you know, can help lead to lowering technology costs in education and hopefully by proxy education costs, um, as well as reducing costs and waste in, in public sector and uh, creating more accessible materials, which opens, you know, helps increase access. So how can we foster additional institutional collaboration, right? Because as I said, this, this initiative is not special, but here's just some uh, thoughts I have in that area. So the first thing is realizing that none of us are snowflakes. Um, my project is not some special little snowflake that doesn't exist anywhere else. My unit is doing things that are done at basically every institution um, across, you know, at least the United States, if not globally, uh, of our size, right? So every large institution naturally has units downstream from it, have, you know, universities have colleges, other colleges exist that, you know, specialize in the same types of topics. Um, we're all doing very similar things. There's someone else in the world doing the same type of thing that you are, you know, work doppelganger, if you will. Um, so realize that and seek out other people to work with because you're still going to have a job doing that but you can build you know systems together and work in a common direction uh, vendors when you you know come on site help lend a voice to the projects that you know people in the public sector are working on um, a lot of times there's this you know kind of the uh, no man is a prophet in his own land type of scenario going on where you don't want to believe that the people down the hall are doing things special because, well, I see them all the time and that's whatever. They couldn't possibly do anything special. Uh, so, you know, help build up the fact that, you know, technological decisions being made are you know, good and bad, right? I mean, we, we don't always know what we're doing, but a lot of times people do know what they're doing. So helping lend a voice and credence, you know, can help get you a lot of goodwill points with an organization. Um, and, you know, again, for, for vendors, 
you know, build clients up and then keep moving on, right? Because there's this vast ocean of websites and projects that need to be produced. Um, there's no reason to just kind of sit in the, like, oh, well, we're going to rope people into this large support contract model, right? That's why we're trying to get away from proprietary software so that you can be portable with who's supporting your product. That's not to say we're going to always leave whoever that is, um, but, you know, it's it's a nice feeling having that option in case a relationship goes bad in, in some way. Uh, to management, don't isolate your staff. Allow them to, you know, participate. Encourage them to go out, get out there and be active in different communities, uh, it's particularly open source communities. Um, share experiences locally, you know, and encourage talking about the things that went well and didn't go well. Um, it's very important to know that, you know, someone down the hall wasted, you know, with air quotes, a week trying to debug a problem. Um, that's a really important story, you know, once they got to success, but almost more importantly is seeing all the opportunities for failure along the way and knowing what projects to avoid, uh, what things to explore more deeply. Uh, these are really important stories that need to get out there, whether that's blogging or, or posting on social media, whatever it is. Um, innovation typically lives in the collaborations between organizations. Um, and this is, you know, people have books written about this stuff, but uh, basically when you work with people that are, you know, diverse and outside of your comfort zone and what you're focused on every day, it generates new ideas uh, because you have to empathize with them. Uh, and the last thing, I just saw this on Twitter the other day, I thought it was funny. Uh, managers, if you call your people resources, then they get to call you overhead. Um, this is increasingly true as, you know, things progress towards singularity and, you know, newer models of uh, organizational structure um, because if you're not innovating and you're not providing anything other than telling people what to do, um, that is an automatable skill set at some level, right? So just make sure everybody's happy. <laughs> um, staff uh, work with reckless abandon. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, don't fear being fired. Uh, particularly in this area, right, in Drupal. Drupal's an incredibly profitable industry. Um, there's no reason to sit and work in a job in a working context that you hate, um, particularly in, you know, this area, right? Uh, IT skills and, and, and CMS technologies, it's a, one of the few areas of, of society that you can really make good money in and get a job pretty quickly. Um, so, don't just work someplace because you need to pay the mortgage, right? Like try and be active in changing the organization, make it a better place and desire that. And if it doesn't work out and, you know, you've gone as far as you can there, then move on. You, you try. Um, leverage community. You need to unite with the people around you and build, you know, user groups, build platforms together. Um, this is the easy, you know, this leads back into the other things with this is where innovation comes from is the sharing of ideas across, across people and, and units. Um, but, you know, by leveraging community, you can also do a lot more as an individual through mind share and things. Um, and related to that, tell everyone everything that you know and do. Um, when I, I was not comfortable blogging several years ago, just stopping to reflect on what it was I was working on. Um, but the number of times people have told me that they've gone back and, you know, found a post via random Google search or whatever, uh, that if something I had talked about years ago or months ago or whatever, um, and that it saved them time or it helped them explore a concept. Um, you know, when you're, I have kind of this idea that if you, the difference between people that are on stage talking about something, especially in the Drupal community, and those that are not, is usually... Um, they weren't afraid to talk about it. Um, they weren't afraid to put their ideas out there and, and quite frankly, you know, be ridiculed potentially at times, right? Uh, transparency can be an embarrassing thing at times, but it makes you a better person, a better developer. Um, and abstract your, your use cases. Uh, so I, I need, unfortunately, a large table to demonstrate why abstracting your use cases is important and what that means, but uh, this is uh, kind of a small window into the impact of um, ELMS and the ELMS Learning Network project in general. Uh, so these are some of the top 
you know, install and downloaded modules that have come from Elms Learning Network. And you'll notice none of them have the word Elms in them. Uh, so because of the Elms initiative, we're allowed to contribute everything back as GPL v2 um, or, or above. It just has to be GPL. So you can see here that we've got all of these installs and downloads of projects that had they been namespaced as Elms or had they just been written specifically for Elms, I guarantee none of these people would be using them or very few. Um, maybe the only exception is the outline designer because that's a project that allows you to, uh, you know, it's very popular with instructional designers. Um, but, you know, things like TinyNav, uh, which is a jQuery library for for um, mobile, mobile responsive stuff with simplistic menus. Um, Profiler Builder, which is for building distributions uh, from you know, established websites and, and helping people understand how to create an install profile and how to manage a distribution. Um, these are things that would not have happened if it weren't for uh, Elms and the Elms Learning Network and me stepping back from the use case, which was, hey, I gotta build a lot of distributions. I need a way of helping me build distributions faster. Uh, so if I just attacked each distribution independently, I would not have been able to see that I could produce something that will help automate that. Um, and and you know, just the last thing in closing here, um, I'm going to steal a page from the Lego movie because it's out recently and my son loves it. And I love the movie and the message of it, but things are special because we believe they are. Uh, believe that whatever you're doing is special. You know, share code, share your experiences. That's really the main point of what I've been describing here today. You know, share everything you can uh, with everyone you can. Accept criticism, give criticism for ideas. You know, expect nothing in return for the, your project and don't talk about your project like it's special. Um, and it will become special. Be humble in your project. Um, it's, it's an incredibly humbling feeling to know that there are people out there downloading the things that you sit there and make every day um, and finding you know, value in them. Um, things that you know, you've contributed months and years earlier that maybe you just said, hey, you know, whatever, I'll put it out there. Uh, that might really come in handy for other people and allow them to build you know, more special, cool things faster. Uh, so looking at life through the, kind of the, the network effects and seeing that whatever you do is special if you just believe that it can be special. Uh, so I'd really like to thank uh, Mark, Kathy, and the Center for Patient Partnerships for believing that the Elms Learning Network and this initiative are special. And I'm really excited about the special things that we're going to be able to build together. So thank you for coming today. We've got my oops, you broke it. That's the only glitch in this entire re-recording. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this this talk. It's a very different one than any one that I've ever given before, which is why it's the only one that I've re-recorded. So have a good day. <laughs>